And welcome to another edition of South Texas Crossfire. This is attorney Joe Flores reminding you to join us each and every week right here on KTMV with the Lopez family. Special thanks to my good friend Carlos Lopez. You guessed it, the Ted Turner of South Texas Broadcasting. <laughs> with me today, I have the distinct honor, pardon the pun, of introducing a great judge, a judge's judge, somebody who I've appeared in front of, and many of you have probably seen it at their home because she was knocking on thousands of doors to get those votes to be up here and serve you, and that's none other than Judge Sandra Watt, 117th District Court. Welcome. How are you? Thank you for inviting me. Well, thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, you know, we had planned this for a while, mm -hmm. but something came up, and I want to jump in feet first, and we were going to talk about the voting laws here in Texas. Mm -hmm. Even me as an attorney and other people, constituents that watch the show, are a little confused on the IDs and other things there. What's your view on that, uh, uh, you know, as a matter of law and then as a matter of logistics, really people going out there and voting with the way Texas law stands right now? Okay. I'm going to admit to you that I this November I will have been voting a total of 49 years. Oh, wow. So I go Monday, the first day, to early vote in this constitutional election. And I, I, I say to my friends, and so I'll say on teeth, you know, fat, dumb, and happy. And I bring my voter registration, which I always have, that has been sent to me every two years by the county because unless you have relocated it automatically comes to the last known address and I took with me a voter ID because this is the first election that you have to present according to the law with a valid voter ID and they must post what is valid and they did have it posted and the number one voter valid voter ID to present is your driver's license Correct. so I, in effect, take both out and I present my registration, which I carry with me at all times, and my voter ID. And the first thing I hear is that they're not the same. And I said, what do you mean they're not the same? I said, I have presented with you what is required under the law, which is a voter, I mean, a, a valid voter ID. Well, it has to be the same. And I said, I'd like you to present to me the law. Uh, and sure enough, they, he says, well, in our training, we've been trained that the voter registration has to be identical to the voter ID. In other words, the, the voter registration certificate and the voter ID have to be identical. And I said, it's my best recollection that's not in the law. But of course, it's now part of the regs, and the Secretary of State's office has now made that decision that it has to be identical. So then I said, well, that's just ludicrous. I says, I've been voting this way for 49 years. And he said, well, you can sign an AKA, an, an affidavit stating that you are one and the same person. And I says, well, what has been good for 49 years all of a sudden is no longer enough. And certainly I signed the AKA because if I hadn't signed the AKA, I would not have been able to vote and I would have had to vote, then I would have been offered a provisional ballot, which in my opinion is like not voting, okay? Not all provisional ballots are, are counted unless there is a close election and then it is the county board that sits and decides whether these uh, provisional ballots uh, will be counted. So certainly I signed the AKA and as I was walking upstairs to my courthouse I said, you know, women are going to be proportionally uh, greatly affected by this. Right. A man is born and the, generally speaking, the name on his birth certificate is going to be the name on his death certificate. For women, that is not the case because most women assume, not all, the surnames of their spouses. They may assume their surname with a hyphen. They may decide to add the name and instead of substituting the name. I grant divorces every day and I have to restore maiden names to some women who request them. And in the Hispanic culture, it's not unheard of is that an individual takes both the maternal and the paternal surnames. Right. So here we have a situation that if it's not identical, we have vested in an election worker 
who most of the time are retired individuals, and thank heavens they come forward because we wouldn't be able to run our elections without them. That's right. And sometimes they will receive a training. So this election worker, the law, the language in the law, Joe, is unbelievable. And I read through the law when this all happened back, and I thought, it can't be. Here's what the law says, that when I present myself to vote, I am offering to vote. Okay. Okay. I always thought that when I went to the polling place, I'm ready to vote. Okay. But according to the law and the language is in there, I am offering to vote. So like any other thing, who's going to accept me to vote? Well, it's the election worker. I must present a valid uh, photo ID. Then he verifies the photo ID with the registration. Okay. Now he has a computer. I had both certificates in my hand. And then he decides whether I will be accepted to vote if he can verify, and according to the Secretary of State's regulations, it must be identical. So if he verifies that I am one and the same person, identical, then I get to vote. I'm accepted to so vote. So John Doe Smith divorces uh, Mr. Smith and becomes uh, Jane Doe now. And if she brings both identical, uh, uh, well, she brings both IDs and one says uh, Jane Doe Smith and one says Jane Doe, they can turn her away from the polls? Okay, again. What it states is that election worker is going to make a determination whether it is substantially similar. And they do have guidelines. You know, sure. for example, if you haven't got a junior on one of yours, but you have a junior on your on uh, your registration, then they'll determine whether that's substantially similar. And in most cases, they're going to determine that. And you will get to sign an a AKA that you're one and the same. It sounds like another way to maybe turn some people away from the polls or having a chilling effect on voting. I think what disturbs me the most is the discretion that is given to a election worker on a fundamental or constitutional right to vote. So that election worker has the right to say it is substantially similar. You may vote, but you must sign this AKFA affidavit. Or that worker can say, you know, this is not substantially similar. We're not turning you away, but you have to vote a provisional ballot. And a provisional ballot, say somebody in the nursing home who hasn't carried a driver's license for 20 years. They're 95 years old. They've been in the nursing home, and they were brought over there. They don't have a updated picture ID. They don't have a concealed handgun license. All they have is their card. They're going to get a provisional ballot. They have to present a voter ID. And, and, They're not you know. going to get a, pro if they can't present, you must, I mean, that is mandatory in the new law that you must present one of these. And, and this is going to now, put another hurdle, as did the voting machines. Now, I have heard no one's going to get turned away. So if you don't have a voter ID, you get to, supposedly you get to vote provisionally. But here's provisional. the catch. Here's the catch. You must present yourself in six days with right. a valid voter ID. ID, one of those eight that's on the list, and if you don't present yourself in six days with that, then your provisional ballot will not be That's counted. my understanding. But there's a little subsection D in the law, Joe, that says this. Even if you follow all of the procedures required for a provisional ballot, there is no guarantee that the provisional ballot will be counted. And this can sway elections, this can suppress votes, and and doesn't it, uh, it may impact, as I mentioned, one example, the elderly, uh, perhaps the poor, people that have been divorced or gotten out of a domestic violence situation and they haven't changed their name or gotten the substantially similar IDs, aren't those people going to be turned away? And they have, now, they barely came to vote, you know, and then they say, oh, come back in six days and show us more proof. That's exactly right. You know, who's going to do that? Well, the first thing is, can you get the proof in six days? And, and we okay. know, uh, you know, you to get a, get a driver's license. You can get a driver's license, license and mm -hmm. I'm told, because I've had the same driver's license that has to be renewed, I think, now in 2017 for me, but that's the same driver's license I've had for 52 years. Sure. You know, what happened in the state of Texas is that in 1964, when I got married, that when I went to uh, ch uh, change my name on my driver's license, the state changed it to my maiden name as my middle name. 
every other legal document I have has my birth middle name, which oh. is Lee. So my driver's license says Sandra Matheson Watts. My voter registration, my passport, every other legal document I have is Sandra Lee Watts. Okay? It's not, it, it is not identical. So then the election worker has an election. He has an election. Is it substantially similar? Then he will let me sign an AKA after David that I'm one and the same and I get to vote. But if he decides Matheson and Lee not substantially similar, then he's going to say, well, you're going to have to vote provisionally. And you came here to vote in the, let me get this straight for the, for the viewers out there. You came in, you're a district judge. You came downstairs. Your, your name is like a household name around here. And they say, here. hi, judge, as I walk yes. up. Yes, <laughs> and then they say you can't vote. I mean, it's absolutely. No, they, didn't, they never said I can't vote. You need to clarify that. Okay. And what I've been told is nobody's going to be turned away. You're either going to get a vote, a regular ballot, or, or you the get provisional. To this wonderful provisional ballot that See, may or may not be counted. Okay, in my opinion, and this is only my opinion, a provisional ballot, and then if somebody has to come back in six days and they're in a nursing home or they have to take a bus or they barely wanted to come vote because it's such a, you know, the line was long, who's going to do that? I mean, and you then know. And you must go to the place they direct you, and the law says they're going to give you a map to show you how to get oh, there. But you know. here's the deal. Six days is a very short period of time. Let's say you go to vote, um, um, you know, on a Tuesday, and you got six days to go to and get this ballot. You know, had I presented my passport, this would not have been an issue because my, my voter registration, my passport, but I presented the number one thing, which is what everybody's going to present, and that is their, their driver's license. Now, here's the effect. Whenever you ask a group of citizens to do more to vote than another group of citizens, the bottom line, that's called unequal protection of the law. That's true. And so women proportionally are going to be asked to sign that AK affidavit a ton more than men. I talked to a, uh, a friend of mine in Austin, Texas, who happens to be a reporter with the Austin Statesman. He told me that in Travis County, 50% of the voters are having to sign the affidavit. Uh, that is a 50 critical. Fifty percent in Travis County. That 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 is so critical. We've got a minute left. What would you want to tell the voters out there and you, as a citizen, as a voter, if they are just shocked by this and they want to get involved or change this law? Change it is the law is being challenged as we speak. Not necessarily for this issue. The law was already being challenged on several other counts. But here's the deal. A lot of people think, well, this is nothing. Just sign the affidavit, okay? Mm -hmm. Why would I have to sign an affidavit when it's a constitutional right? And I have valid IDs that have been given to me by the state of Texas and or by the county of Nueces, and now I have to sign uh, an AKA affidavit. That discourages people from even showing up. Now, I can tell you the response that I've received is, oh, my heavens, I better go check mine. And you can't imagine the number of women who says, mine's not the same. And this is the way things got affected for African-Americans way back in the day when they would say, can you read? Can you do this? Can you do that? You know, and, and there's a, just another... It, they made it almost a hostile environment to go vote. Now it's more of a bureaucratic, which can be hostile. It's bureaucratic. And yes. there, there's going to be some people who have heard out there that it has to be identical. And they're going to say, well, mine's not identical. I guess I can't vote. I guess I can't vote. Okay. Well, yeah. Then there's some people who are going to say, if they're, all they're going to let me do is vote provisionally, then I'm not even going to bother to vote. Now, it just so happens I take voting very seriously, and unless I'm sick or out of town or whatever, I, I, I vote. And what about people who absentee vote and then their name won't be, uh, you know, I want to talk... my understanding from reading the law that the provisions, the provisions of the law are applicable to absentee ballot. Uh, and, and, and military. It's applicable to everyone. So, the so only exception it's gonna be, that I saw in the law was over 70. So it's going to be even harder for our men and women in uniform overseas to fix this. It would be harder for an absentee ballot to be corrected or cured. 
again, um, six days is a short period of time. Yeah. Well, we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna take a break. This is a very important issue, and we're here with Judge Sandra Watts, one seventeenth District Court, and we'll take a break. When we come back, we're gonna talk about that, but we're also gonna talk a little bit about what she does as a judge here, which is very important. So grab your sodas, popcorn, take a break. We'll be right back. Have you been arrested or are potentially facing criminal charges? You need a trial attorney who is well-versed in the courtroom. Joe Flores has handled hundreds of criminal cases and many of them to trial. Joe Flores can provide you with competent representation to protect your constitutional rights in state and federal court. Joe Flores can help if you have been arrested or facing criminal charges. The Law Offices of Joe Flores. Equal justice for all. Have you or a loved one suffered a stroke, heart attack, unexplained low blood pressure, or death during dialysis? The FDA has issued warnings and recalled the product Granuflo and Naturalite used in dialysis. At least one national company failed to warn the public that over 900 people had suffered cardiac arrest or death. A condition called metabolic alkalosis developed, which may have caused the harm. Call the law offices of Joe Flores today. With a combined 25 years of experience in the medical field and as a trial lawyer, Joe Flores can help. Call now. I think it's a, a betrayal of public trust. That is just not ethical. I left the Democratic Party because of her. The reason is, is because you're taking Republican money. The money of those people that pay me as a consultant. What are you taking? Why did you take it cross town? Took money. I saw it and I saw them paying checks. <laughs> Okay, hold on. Everybody. Hi, this is attorney and board certified nurse practitioner Joe Flores on behalf of Vasquez Flores Home Health. Nursing homes have their place, but having care in your own home is very important. Call today for more information. Backed by over 20 years of experience, registered nurse Priscilla Vasquez can answer your questions about home care. Call 881-9922. That's 881-9922 today. And we're back after a brief break. You're watching South Texas Crossfire. We're going to jump feet first in once again. But thanks to our sponsors, Vasquez Flores Home Health, 881-9922. Nursing homes have their place, but those who want to have their autonomy and stay at home, give her a call, Priscilla Vasquez, 881-9922. And thanks for Lopez Broadcasting for making all this happen. We're back with Judge Sandra Watts. Welcome back. Thank you for having me. Well, we had a spirited discussion, which I'm very troubled about, and the viewers, every single one of you, Republican, Democrat, Independent, Tea Party, whatever, should be very concerned about is the voter ID. And just to recap, substantially similar standard. If your name, say you were divorced or you changed your name, uh, you were saying, uh, just to kind of marshal or sum it up, uh, what, how, how is the law as it stands now? Well, what it is, is that the regulations that were implemented to, I mean, that were drafted by the Secretary's Office to implement the law says that they must be substantially, they must be identical, but the election worker then can determine whether it is substantially similar. And if he decides or she decides it's substantially similar, then you get to vote, but you must sign an affidavit that says you're one and the same person. And you have six days to fix the problem. No. That's, no. You get to vote. You get to vote. You get to vote. But if that worker says these are not substantially similar, then he will offer you a right to vote provisionally. <laughs> Provisional ballot. And then you've got some procedures you have to follow, one of which is you've got to show up in six days with the right identification, which sometimes is very difficult if six, two of your days is a weekend. Six days. The only one I know that could create something in six days with our Lord and Savior, uh, try to get a driver's license or another 
another ID on that. So in other words, come November, I mean, we're talking about right now, I hate to date my programs, but there's a big, uh, you know, thing coming up with Destination Bayfront, however that works, uh, out with the voters as they speak about that. But also the general election of 2014, how is this going to impact, in your opinion, impact 2014? It, you know, it's the same law for all the elections. However, I think this election that they are in effect, I'm, I, I don't know this for a fact, but I think that they are finding more substantially similar than they are. I don't know. I checked it a week ago. There was no provisional ballots in Nueces County. However, when you ask 50% of the voting population in Travis County to sign an AKA affidavit, <laughs> it, it baffles my mind that our voting procedure is that the, is vesting in this election worker. Primaries are held by the individual parties, so I don't think you're going to have that much problem in the primaries. It's in the general elections. Number one, think of the lines in the general elections. Think that it does take additional time to, in effect, clarify this because people are going to be responsible. This is what I have. This is my voter ID. Sure. Somebody's going to have to take time to explain. Oh, you can still get the vote, but you got to do the AKA, which is a little affidavit they already have there prepared. Uh, but they're not going to be happy. It's going to take more time to vote. And in close elections, in close elections, that discretion given the election worker between substantially similar, not substantially similar, regular ballot with an affidavit, or a provisional ballot could be very important. Very critical. People have lost elections by one vote, and uh, anything like that that could happen uh, could cause an election contest, could cause all of this uh, cost to the taxpayer, not to mention confusion, and it may just make some people stay home and say, this is just too much. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, not to segue too, too far afield from this, because this is a very vital issue. Uh, now we've talked about it as a voter, a concerned mm -hmm. citizen. Let's talk about your position as a district judge. Sure. Uh, uh, you know, to talk about how long you've been up here. Actually, you've been up here close to a, as long as I've practiced law. This is your third <laughs> or fourth term. Yes. In fact, I'm running for another term. Uh, I have completed 11 years on the bench, so I will have one more year on my third term, and then I am going to present myself to the voters once again for a fourth term. I, I love this job. This job, I hate to say it, is just made for me. <laughs> I can tell. It starts at 8 and then starts back at 1. It's like the trains and Grand Central Station. You're on time. You move your docket like nobody else. I believe time is a very valuable commodity. And the courts, the only thing we have to offer is what? Time for you to resolve disputes. That is the litigants and the lawyers. And so time becomes a very valuable commodity. The more hours you have available, to the public to resolve disputes, the greater and the number that can be resolved in an efficient time. But it's after hours too because you have, the, you know, night court, drug court. Tell us about some of the programs you've instituted that help people with drug problems, that help people after hours. Uh, I was a relatively new judge when I began the divert court, which is a uh, drug program or a drug court. It is a specialized court. We met at, uh, on Tuesdays, was the day that I selected, and I met with all the staff at 6 o'clock in the evening on Tuesdays, and then all the folks in the drug court came in at 7. That, th I did that for six years, and usually I was out by 8.30 or 9, so Tuesdays was a really long day. But still, you know, I mean, uh, most judges wouldn't do that, but the other thing that you're legendary for is... Um, was it, I hate to give uh, a certain airline a plug, but Southwest or Continental, <laughs> that you went to law school uh, twice a week with uh, one of my other favorite judges, Janice Graham Jack. My wife loves her because she puts me in my place. <laughs> uh, uh, and, uh, but in a very loving, nice way. Uh, but you all commuted together. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, you know, when you are in Corpus Christi, Texas, there is no law school in Corpus Christi, Texas. In fact, at that point, all the law schools were San Antonio North. 
And so if you wanted to advance, you had to figure out how you were going to go to law school. I got accepted to law school after I had been a teacher for nine years. And uh, what I did is I cashed in my teacher retirement and I bought airline tickets on Southwest wow. Airlines. Flew out of here every day, uh, sometimes at 6.30, not every day, excuse me, sometimes at 6.30, 9.30, twice or three times a week. And then I was home by midnight on that same day. Three years. Two and a half. Two and a half. After the first semester, I've always believed, you know, if it's just miserable, let's just increase the misery and get it <laughs> over with. And so it took me two and a half years to get through law school. So you and Judge Jack yes. together. Absolutely. And uh, so when you came back, you practiced in family law primarily? I was a general practitioner. Oh, I, general I was practitioner. a jack of all trades. Um, and Known I, as a lioness in family law, yeah. though, I'll tell you. <laughs> and then family law found me. And yes. I was good at it. And I became board certified in family law. And then prior to taking the bench, that was you know, what I did 100% of the time. And, uh, you know, time has flown by. But for the voters out there, you have the floor, Your Honor, as always. Uh, you know, they're out there. And we now have uh, viewers in San Pat and Aransas. Mm -hmm. But you are running here in Oasis County. Correct. 117th District Court. Those uh, 300,000 households that are watching, uh, what would you like to tell them about serving on the bench? It's, it's an absolute honor to be a judge. And um, I'm so pleased that in 2002, the voters trusted me and elected me to this position. And I, I, when I it was very simply, I had very little promises. What I said was, I will respect your time. I will uh, listen to your cases, I will be prepared on your cases, and then I will rule based on the law and the facts and no other factor. And I think I have fulfilled those promises. Uh, again, I love what I do. Uh, I can't think of anything I would rather do. Uh, people have said, well, why don't you run for the appellate court? No, I am a people person. I want to be with people. I want and that doesn't mean the appellate court doesn't. They grade my papers, <laughs> <laughs> but I I need that people contact, and that's why I love being uh, a trial judge. And when you run for office, you literally do. You knock on thousands of doors, and you work hard on your campaigns. I did. I only had to do that once, Joe. And the reason is, is I did have an opponent in the primary, in the Democratic primary. <laughs> After that, I've not drawn a Republican nor a Democratic opponent in each subsequent election. And I have to tell you, the most wonderful thing in the whole world is to be lonely on the ballot, where your name is the only one there for that bench. And you get 100% of the vote. I yeah, love that. You, yeah, you love that. <laughs> and so I'm hoping that repeats itself this time. <laughs> uh, we've got about a minute left. What would you like to see? Uh, what, what, are, what are your concerns as far as societal things? Things that you're seeing here in front of you, cases, and what are your concerns in society that, you, that you're seeing that you would like to see change or maybe the government intervene? Is it um, our children? Is it drug uh, problems? Is it, uh, what is it? What is the, a burning issue right now? You know, one of the things that really kind of disturbs me is that the number of young people that get caught up in the criminal justice system. And generally it starts with possession and then it's drugs and, you know, and, and it's thefts and things of that nature. Once you're in that system, it's real hard. And what you have done when you get in that system, if you have a conviction, it's hard to get a job. Well, if you don't have a job, Joe, it's hard to raise a family. If you don't have, you know, a job and have some funds coming in, the bottom line is, is that you, you know, there's not a lot to look forward to. And it's that group of young people that I see coming into my system that they come over and over and over again. The lives that are being affected there and their children's lives that are being affected is very disturbing to me. Because it not only affects them, it affects all the family. Oh, no question. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, and I will tell you, Texas has taken a dramatic step in turning to um, um, alternative views or alternative solutions to sending people to, to the penitentiary. Good for Texas, but for nonviolent, right? For, for drug addressed. users. It's okay. Drugs. Yes. Okay, because the, well, not 80 percent of what we do is drug related, Joe. Oh, 80%. my Lord. So if you don't, you know, I often say I can send somebody to the penitentiary. 
But if they're a drug addict going in for eight months, I promise you they're going to be a drug addict coming out at the end of eight months or a drug addict going in at two years or four years, et cetera. And by the way, as taxpayers, it's a very difficult, expensive proposition to run penitentiaries. And the question is the effectiveness of where our dollars go. And treatment is so much more effective than penitentiaries are in correcting the problem because of the recidivism rate on prisons. You know, we send them to prisons. Yes, the public is protected. Yes, they're not, hopefully not doing drugs while they're in prison. And the bottom line is, as soon as they get out, no job, they go back to what they're doing, and that's that recidivism rate that goes over and over. If we can take the problem, the addiction, and deal with the addiction and solve that problem, then the recidivism rate of return to the penitentiary is greatly reduced. Well, I want to thank Judge Sandra Watts, your district judge here in Noises County, 117th District Court, serving us for over three terms, fourth now coming up, and uh, we wish you the very best in <laughs> next November. And thank you for also sharing your views on voting. I think you've educated the voter on what they need to do to make sure they're up to snuff, and maybe we can change well, or modify this law. The key thing is don't give up. Go. Vote. If there's a problem, then we can address the problem after the fact. But if you never go to vote, then the law has done what I fear it's going to do, which is to reduce those voting, the numbers voting. Judge Sandra Watts with us, and uh, thank you so much for taking the time. You bet. And uh, we want to thank, lastly, our biggest sponsor, God. Without him, nothing is possible. This is Joe Flores and Dave Mendes behind the camera saying thank you, God bless. <laughs> and good night.